Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Wednesday evening seminar. Tonight, we're looking at part two of problems on construction projects, and we are joined by Brandon Silver, who is consultant solicitor at Fletcher Day. Good evening, Brandon. Good evening, Julie. Okay, uh, as always, as Brandon does his presentation, if there's anything you'd like to ask him, please feel free to use the chat facility or the Q&A facility in the bottom toolbar. He will happily answer any questions that you have. Alternatively, if there's something you'd like to ask him, but you don't wish to do so in an open forum, please feel free to use his email address, which you'll see on screen shortly. That's brandon.silver at fletcherday.co.uk and uh, email him your question and he will happily answer this for you. Okay, without any further ado, Brandon, I will hand over to you. Thanks, Julie. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, just to give a bit of background about myself before we talk uh, today about further problems in the construction industry, I'm a consultant solicitor at Fletcher Day, and I deal with both transactional and contentious construction law matters. So I deal with different forms of dispute resolution, mainly adjudication and litigation. And as well as the contentious side, I also deal with more of the transactional side. So assisting in drafting contracts, reviewing those contracts and also negotiating those contracts. And I'm also currently undertaking the RICS Diploma in Adjudication course. So today is um, kind of linking to the last um, seminar that we discussed, and it's part two of problems on construction projects. And today we're going to focus on four uh, different areas, liquidated damages, loss and expense, payment and adjudication. Um, these are four of the most common topics that um, come up when you're talking about construction projects. And in each topic, I'm going to talk about some of the main questions that crop up in those. So firstly, with liquidated damages. Firstly, well, what is liquidated damages? Liquidated damages is a fixed or determined sum agreed by the parties to a contract to be payable on breach by one of the parties. So, for example, in a construction contract, what you normally see is that there's liquidated damages when the contractor fails to complete by the completion date. And what it normally will provide is, for example, £3,000 per week payable in liquidated damages for every week or part thereof that you are in delay and that you have not completed the works by the, com by the completion date. Now, the first question is, well, when are the liquidated damages a penalty clause? Now, the reason that this is important is because if the liquidated damages clause is a penalty, it means it's not enforceable. And what that means is that the employer, if it's a contract between an employer and contractor, the employer cannot rely on that contract if the works have gone beyond the completion date. They cannot rely on that clause. So when will a dam liquidated damages clause be a penalty? Well, the test used to be that a liquidated damages clause will be a penalty clause if it is not, not a genuine pre-estimate of the loss. However, that rule has now been relaxed. And what the rule is as follows. Even if it is not a genuine pre-estimate of the loss, the liquidated damages clause, the employer, the party relying on the liquidated damages clause, can still rely upon it and it will not be a penalty if it has a legitimate interest in requiring the defaulting party, the contractor, to pay a sum in excess of the loss suffered and the charge is not out of all proportionate portion to the legitimate interest. So breaking that down, even if your the liquidated damages is not a genuine pre-estimate of the loss, it's exceeding the loss you've suffered, if there's a legitimate interest in charging an excess sum and that charge is not in excess of the, is not out of all proportion to the legitimate interest, it will not be a penalty clause. Now, the best way is to give an example, and is actually to give the case where this rule was established. And it was a parking case. And what happened was, was cars were parking in the car parking lot and not paying for a ticket. And in this case, the, the damages was that the car parking company was charging them 85 pounds because they hadn't paid for a ticket. And the drivers were saying, well, it's in excess of what I would have had to, well, the, sorry, it's in excess of the loss you've suffered because if I had paid for a ticket, well, it would have been five pounds and you've charged 85. And they held that it wasn't a penalty clause, that they could charge the 85 pounds. And they said that it was because there was a legitimate interest. The legitimate interest in this case being that 
It was they had an interest to manage the car parking lot and an interest to ensure that people did not park in spaces for longer than necessary so that other people could use the car parking lot. And they held that the £85 was in proportion to that legitimate interest. So it's very clear that the rules have been relaxed and it doesn't necessarily have to be a genuine pre-estimate of the loss, but you need to have a legitimate interest and it needs to be in proportion to that legitimate interest. The second question, and it ties in nicely with the first question is, can an employer recover liquidated damages if no loss is suffered? The simple answer is yes, an employer can recover liquidated damages if no loss is suffered. You do not have to prove your loss and you'll be able to recover the liquidated damages in the contract, as already stated, provided that it's not a penalty clause. Looking at it from the other side, the other way around, what happens if the employer has suffered, say, a million pounds of loss and the liquidated damages will mean that you actually recover a smaller amount of loss? Well, the question, is, the answer is, you can only recover what is the liquidated damages. You cannot actually recover your actual loss. So that's why it's important at the beginning of the contract to make sure whatever liquidated damages you put is a genuine pre-estimate of the loss. Third question in the liquidated damages topic, can a contractor pass the main contract liquidated damages down to a subcontractor where they are out of proportion to the subcontract sum? The answer is yes. The only issue again is to not make sure it's a penalty clause. Now, in this instance, the reason that it would be a penalty clause if the, if the subcontractor is not on the critical path and therefore did not cause delay to the works. If you're giving it, if the subcontractor is with an M&E contractor, subcontractor, then this would likely not be a penalty clause because the subcontractor would be on the critical path and provided you could show that they caused delay to the works, then that would not be a problem that you could pass down the liquidated damages. The fourth question, what happens to liquidated damages if the contractor's employment is terminated? Now, this is very topical for right now. And there was actually a recent case, only I would say two or three months ago, that was dealing with this exact point. Now, this question is talking about where the employer is terminating the contract after the completion date. The works have not been completed by the completion date. The contractor is in default. And because of that, the employer has elected to terminate the contract. Now, the question is, well, what happens to the liquidated damages if the contractor's employment is terminated? And there are three different options. And I will then tell you which option applies. So there's three avenues you could go down. Firstly, it could be that the liquidated damages clause does not apply to any period of delay for completion of the work. In other words, the liquidated damages clause does not apply. The employer cannot rely upon it and cannot claim liquidated damages. The second option is that the clause applies only up until termination, after which general damages are recoverable, but not liquidated damages. And the third option is that the clause continues to apply even after termination of the contract until completion is finally achieved by a replacement contractor. So those are the three options. Now, what the case, uh, which is called Triple Point, dealt with this uh, only this year, was that they found that it was depending upon the wording of the liquidated damages clause as to which of those three options apply. The courts held, however, that the orthodox opinion, uh, position is the second, namely that the liquidated damages clause applies up until the termination by the employer, and that after that time, general damages are recoverable. I'm now gonna actually look at the clause that was in question in the triple point, in the triple point case. The triple point uh, liquidated damage clause provides that liquidated damages were payable up to the date that the employer accepts such work from the contractor. Now, the argument from the contractor is that the employer would never accept the work from the contractor and therefore the liquidated damages clause could fall through, could fall through. And the reason being that because the contractor will never complete the works, the employer will never such, accept such work from the contractor and therefore it does not apply. However, what the Supreme Court held, so there was a lot of different appeals and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, is that reference to acceptance of works was in addition to and not in substitution for the right to liquidated damages down to termination. 
So even in this clause, when it said about employer accepting such work, the employer could recover liquidated damages up until termination, but after termination could not recover liquidated damages and instead had to recover general damages. Now, from a policy point of view, this kind of makes sense because if the employer was able to uh, claim liquidated damages until the replacement contractor completed the works, then there's no mitigation and the replacement contractor could take all the time it wants and the contractor would have no recoverability and would just be stuck to paying all the liquidated damages up until the replacement contractor completed the works. So that's why the court has um, followed the orthodox position with this wording. Final question on liquidated damages is what happens to liquidated damages if partial possession is taken? Again, similarly with the last question, it very much depends on the wording of the contract. However, if the contract includes partial possession, there should be a proportioning down clause. Now, what that means is that because ultimately some of the works, part of the works have reached practical completion, they've been certified as practically complete by the employer taking possession, the liability for liquidated damages clause should be reduced to reflect that. So what it is doing is it's a clause to relieve the contractor of liability for liquidated damages for those parts where by taking partial possession, those have been certified as practically complete. So moving on to the second topic, the second topic is loss and expense and additional cost claims. Now, the first question I would say of all the questions in today's seminar is the most topical and the question that we get most regularly asked about and causes the most confusion. The question is, does the failure to issue a written notice lose a contractor or subcontractor an entitlement to the payment of loss and expense slash additional cost claims? So what often happens and we often see it in adjudication is that the employ the contractor, sorry, the employer will say that, so the whole point is, is whether or not they've issued a written notice, and if not, does that mean they can't entitle to lost expense? And what the employer often argues is that the contractor has not served the written notice in compliance with the contract, and therefore is not entitled to loss and expense. And they rely upon the clauses in the contract. And those clauses in the contract, what they thought they meant, did not actually mean that. And this very much depends on the wording of the contracts. And I'm going to talk about that now. If you are relying on a clause in the contract which says that you will not have entitlement to loss and expense if you do not serve the written notice, that will only apply if that clause is a condition precedent. And I'm going to read to you a passage from Key Team Construction Contracts, which will hopefully explain to you the type of contract you need to have in your contract to make it possible to say that if you fail to issue a written notice, then the contractor is not entitled to the payment of loss and expense. So the passage is as follows. Many contracts provide that the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time is dependent upon, amongst other things, the service of a notice within a stipulated time of an event causing delay. Courts are normally reluctant to construe the requirements as the form and content of the notice required under such clauses too strictly and unlikely to treat them as a condition precedent to the making of any claim absent, and this is the important bit, clear language to this effect. So there needs to be express wording in the clause for the failure to issue a written notice to amount to the loss of entitlement to loss and expense. Now the whole House of Lords held that there are two requirements that need to be met for a clause to be regarded as a condition precedent in the context of written notices. Number one, the clause needs to state the precise time within which the notice is to be served. And number two, it makes plain by expressed language that unless the notice is served within that time, the party making the claim will lose its rights, i.e. will not be able to recover loss and expense. So that's very much inconsistent with the, with the extract I just read from Keating or construction contracts. Now let's look at an actual example of a clause in question which purports to say that if you don't serve written notice, you then cannot claim loss and expense. And that is clause 4.16.1 of the JCT4. 
Now clause 4.16.1 provides as follows. The contractor shall notify the architect slash contract administrator as soon as the likely effect of a relevant matter on regular progress or the likely nature and extent of any loss and or expense arising from a deferment of possession becomes or should have become reasonably apparent to him. It's very long winded, but basically what the clause is saying is that you need to give notice as soon as the likely of a relevant matter has become, you've become aware of it. Now this clause is not a condition precedent. If you do not as a contractor comply with this clause, you still will be able to, to um, claim loss and expense. And the reason being is, going back to our two uh, criteria that need to be met, it does not state the precise time within the notice has to be served. Simply saying become or should have become reasonably apparent to him is not precise enough. It is very vague. So what is clear is that it has to be very, very express, clear language to be able to say and to have a clause in the contract to say that if you fail to issue that written notice, you cannot then claim loss and expense. So the JCT contract, that doesn't apply. The NEC uh, form of contract does, however, apply. So if you want to have a clause in the contract, this is mainly to the employers I'm talking to, a clause in the contract which provides that if, they, if the contractor does not provide written notice, then they cannot be entitled to lost expense, then you should look at the NEC form. The second question on the uh, lost expense is, well, what is a global claim and is it valid? And this question gets often asked from the contractor side when they're claiming loss and expense. So what is a global claim? Well, a global claim is one where a contractor has suffered loss costs caused by two or more different events, which are employer risks events, i.e. they're the employer is what is responsible for, and that entitles it to an extension of time and loss and expense, but is unwilling to identify the loss caused by each individual event. So there is therefore one global claim for all of the losses arising out of the various events. Now a global claim, which I've just described what it is, can still be valid, but, and this is a strong but, you have to overcome a number of hurdles to achieve entitlement. And the relevant case is water lily. And there is five criteria that need to be met to have a valid global claim. And I'm just gonna briefly go through those five criteria now. Number one, you have to prove the claim as a matter of fact on the balance of probabilities. Balance of probabilities more, meaning more than 50%, more than likely than not likely. Number two, you have to put forward co enough cogent and persuasive evidence to substantiate its alleged loss. Number three, you need to show that it would not have incurred the alleged delay related losses in any event. So it's a but for test. Number four, you highlight any delays that are not the employer's responsibility. And number five, you separately plead any heads of claim where a demonstrable causal link can be proved. And that's the most important one where a lot of parties fall down on. You need to show the causal link. Linking to the next question, well, what is a total cost claim? It's actually a version of a global claim. And the best way to explain what it is, is to give an example. And let's say you have a contractor and they're saying, well, we have spent one million pounds on this project. So far, you've only paid 300,000, we want 700,000, and that is our claim. That is a global total cost claim. And what it ignores is number one, underpricing in the tender. It may be that in the tender, they have failed to take into consideration certain things, and that's actually why they've incurred a million pounds. And number two, it doesn't take into account any losses that are actually the contractor's own fault. Obviously with loss and expense, you can only recover when it's the employer's fault. And what they're trying to do is not provide any certain information, it's very global, and it's just saying, we've spent this, we need this from you because we've not received full sums. And that will fail. So yeah, that's what a total cost claim is. Um, the next question is, what are the most effective methods of evaluating disruption? Well, firstly, well, what is disruption? Disruption claims relate to loss of productivity in the execution of particular activities. And because of the disruption, 
These work activities are now able to be carried out as efficiently as reasonably planned. Now, the most effective method of evaluating disruption is comparing with what was planned against what actually happened. So first of all, you establish what the plan was, you break down the labor resources from tender, and then you plot that on the baseline program, and then you compare that with the actual resources and the actual program. And that difference between the two, when you compare them, should be because of the disrupting event, and that is how you will evaluate the disruption. The final question, and I would say of all the different heads of loss and expense, this is the one which is the most difficult to prove and contractors and subcontractors all too often fail. So if you're gonna pay attention contractors, then please do listen to this question and how I'm going to answer it. So the question is, when advancing a claim, can a contractor recover head office overhead contributions? The very, very, very simple answer is yes. The more complicated answer is it very much depends, sorry, is that is the caveat that you will only be able to succeed in bringing such a claim and you will recover your head office overhead contributions if you provide sufficient information. And there, that is a heavy burden for the contractor. There is a lot of information that needs to be proved and shown and evidenced. So what is that information? Well, what you need to evidence is that if the delay to the works had not occurred, that you would have secured work which would have resulted in a contribution to head office overheads. So what you need to show is that you turned away work and that this was as a result of the delay to the works. It was not because of anything else, it was because of one thing and one thing only, and that was to the delay of the works. And this is the main thing that the contractors are unable to do. What they struggle is that they struggle to prove that they did not take another job and they struggle to prove that the reason they did not take any other job was because of the works. <coughs> and the main reason is, is because they can't prove that they actually got offered another job in the first place. It's very difficult to prove that and it's a very high burden. The other thing you also need to prove is that as a direct result of the delay, you need to employ additional head office overhead resources. So it's a very heavy burden and there's a lot of information you need to prove and it's very difficult to be successful in any claim in recovering this. Having said that, if you can show all of the information, then in calculating the claim, there are different approved formulas such as Hudson's and Ebden and there are different formulas in calculating the head office overhead. Okay, so the next topic is payment. The question is, can a contractor slash subcontractor legitimately refuse to commence a variation until the value is agreed? The short answer is no, you cannot. However, if the contract provides so, then you can, but it is incredibly rare for any such contract to provide that. What the contract will most typically provide, such as, for example, the JCT contract, is that there's a mechanism for uh, agreeing, it, sorry, there's not agreeing, there's a mechanism for working out the valuation of the variation, but it does not provide that you can't do it, you can refuse to commence the variation until such value is agreed. The next question is, well, what is the risk of retention of title clauses in supplier contracts? Firstly, what is a retention of title clause in a contract? So a retention title clause is very favorable for a supplier because what it does is it allows a supplier to retain ownership of goods and materials until specified conditions have been met, most typically payment, so that they retain title of those goods until payment have been made. Now, this is very typical to happen in a construction project because what typically happens is that goods, materials or plant are not paid for until after they've been de delivered to site. And this can put the supplier at risk, particularly if the buyer, typically the, the, the contractor, defaults and becomes insolvent before payment is received. So what they do is protect their position by putting a retention of title clause. However, a retention of title clause can only offer so much protection because 
if the items, the goods or materials are incorporated into the development somehow, somehow fixed into the works, then it does not matter if payment has been, not, has been made, it defeats retention of title and title will pass to the employer. So retention of title clauses only have somewhat beneficial be benefit to the supplier. Another way that actually retention of title clauses are defeated is vesting certificates. Now, what this case is, is that um, what actually happens is the reverse of the example I just gave, is that what actually happens is that before delivery is made, you make payment. And then what happens is, is the supplier is insolvent. What happens there? And what the vesting certificate does is says that the title to goods listed in the certificate will pass to the employer on payment. So that again defeats retention of title. The next question is, can a contractor or subcontractor stop work if not paid? This is another topical question because normally contractors do stop work when they've not been paid. And what actually happens is they realize they couldn't have stopped the work. And what happens is, is they then get terminated themselves. And then there actually uh, has a, there's a claim for a uh, repudiatory breach and that they shouldn't have actually suspended the works, for example. So the question is, can a contractor or subcontractor stop work if not paid? Yes, but that is subject to the final date for payment having elapsed. If the final date for payment hasn't elapsed, then you cannot stop the work. If you stop the work, then that will evince an attention to not be bound by the contract and will amount to a repudiatory breach of contract. And the other side can decide to accept that repudiatory breach and terminate the contract themselves and then claim damages. So you have to be careful when you terminate the contract. You can terminate it if you've not been paid, but you can only terminate after the final date for payment. In addition to this, as well as waiting until after the final date for payment, you also have to wait until after the issue of the seven day notice. You have to let the seven day notice elapse first, otherwise it will be a repudiatory breach. So that's a seven day notice saying that if they do not pay within the seven days, then we will be suspending, suspending the works. You have to follow that procedure. All too often I see companies and contractors not doing this, and then they get a claim for wrongful termination against them. Sorry, they get a repeat claim for repudiatory breach, a claim for termination and a claim for damages. So you have to be very careful when deciding to suspend the works for reason of non-payment. The next question is, what is the purpose of a payment and payless notices and how do they work? Now, the reason that this is an important question is because one of the most typical adjudications that we get in the construction industry is smash and grab adjudications, which I'm sure you're all aware. And that is where a contractor or subcontractor, where an employer fails to issue a payless or payment notice and therefore the sum applied for by the contractor becomes the notified sum and subject to no pay uh, and therefore they're entitled to that payment that's what a smash and grab adjudication is it doesn't matter about the true value of the works because they have not followed the payment mechanism the sum as applied for in the application for payment becomes the notified sum so the question is well, what is a payment and a payless notice well first of all you have an application for payment by the contractor and then you will have a mechanism in the contract which provides that the contractor, the employer, the payer needs to issue a payment notice. And what that payment notice will say is it was, it's where the payer, the employer, values the work done and certifies the payment due. So what it needs to do is set out the sum that it considers due and the basis for the calculation. And that has to be issued on time in compliance with the clauses in the contract. Further, you have then have a pay less notice, and that's an opportunity for the paying party, the employer, to change their mind from what they put in their payment notice if they did issue a payment notice. And they can alter the payment due to the payee near to the end of the payment cycle. So those are the two options, you've got the payment notice and the pay less notice. Now, if you fail to issue either a payment or a pay less notice, then as stated, what happens is, is that the sum applied for is going to become the notified sum, and then you have a smash and grab adjudication. 
Now, other arguments that often happen is that a employer say, well, I did issue a payment notice or a pay less notice. And the contractor argues, well, it was issued out of time or it wasn't in the form of a pay less notice. And there are a lot of arguments on the form and time. So if I cannot stress enough, be familiar with the contract, make sure you serve timely payment and pay less notices. Otherwise, you will be subject to the Decronian uh, result that you have to pay what has been applied for in the uh, contractor's application for payment. You can, of course, once you have a smash and grab adjudication, then have a true value adjudication following that. But obviously, you're incurring further costs, and then there's and you also have to pay in the interim the sum as decided in the smash and grab adjudication. This links nicely to the last topic, talking of adjudication. So the first question is, well, when should you go to adjudication? Well, the question which will probably be phrased, when are you allowed to go to adjudication? You can go to adjudication if a contract provides so. And for example, in the JCT form under Article 7, it provides that you can have a right to refer a dispute to adjudication, and then they refer you to Clause 9.2 of the JCT form. The other option is, is that if there's no contractual clause for adjudication, then the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act can apply, and that if it's a construction contract, then pursuant to that act, you have a right to refer the dispute to adjudication. So you either there's a contractual pr provision which allows for it, or the contract is a construction contract pursuant to the act, and therefore you can dispute, refer the matter to adjudication. And when should you uh, go to adjudication? Well, when you should go to adjudication when you have a dispute with the other side and you need that to be resolved. And the adjudication procedure is 28 days unless agreed by extension. And it's a very fast way of resolving the dispute. So the second question, which links nicely to the first question, well, what is a dispute? What, what can I refer to adjudication? Well, the first thing, is that it has to be a single dispute. Can't refer more than one dispute under the same contractor, under the same contract, the same adjudicator at the same time, unless the parties agree otherwise. Having said that, you can be clever in the way that you draft the wording of the issue. For example, if I say the dispute is the sum due to the contractor, that's going to incorporate a lot of sub issues for example, the value of variations, whether I'm entitled to an extension of time, any, uh, any defects, all of these different things. So whilst it has to be a single dispute, you can phrase the dispute widely enough so that it incorporates a lot of different sub issues. And the dispute will be, defi will be defined, the scope of the dispute will be defined in the notice of adjudication. So before you refer the matter, you have to issue a notice of adjudication to the other side. And one of the things that the notice needs to do is it sets out briefly what the dispute is. And that is very important because you can't then later change during the adjudication what the scope of the dispute is. So the notice of adjudication has to be carefully drafted. Now, the other thing to talk about when talking about a dispute is that before you refer a matter to adjudication, you have to ensure that the dispute has crystallized. If the dispute has not crystallized, then uh, any adjudicator that is appointed will not have jurisdiction to, to decide the dispute and any decision will not be enforceable. So what does it mean to say that the dispute needs to crystallize? What it basically means is that you need the party, you need the party seeking to refer the dispute to notify the other party of their claim and that claim is subsequently disputed or not admitted and a, a period of time needs to elapse for that to happen. If there is none of that, no crystallization, no notifying of the claim you're seeking to bring before you bring it, then any, claim, uh, any adjudication you bring will be unenforceable. So it's very important to ensure that before you refer the matter, the dispute has crystallized. And this links nicely to the next question, well, what is a challenge to jurisdiction? Well, firstly, an adjudicator must have jurisdiction to decide the dispute. If they do not have jurisdiction, then the decision will be enforceable. And any, in any enforcement proceedings, you can refer to the challenges to jurisdiction. 
what normally happens is if the responding party, so you've got the referring party bringing the dispute, the responding party responding, is that they bring challenges to the jurisdiction of the adjudicator. And what they say is, is actually, Mr. Adjudicator, we do not think you have jurisdiction to decide the dispute, and we therefore invite you to resign. And there are two grounds, two uh, main themes of where an adjudicator will not have jurisdiction. Threshold jurisdiction and internal jurisdiction. Threshold jurisdiction is all arising on the question of can the adjudication be set in train at all? And what that basically means is, can I even refer the matter to adjudication in the beginning? Is the adjudicator even allowed to make a decision? Is he even allowed to uh, decide the dispute? And what often happens is that there's threshold jurisdictional challenges arising to do with how the adjudicator has been appointed and that because the adjudicator has not been validly appointed, the adjudicator does not therefore have the relevant threshold jurisdiction and therefore cannot make a decision which is enforceable. And examples of this are, number one, as we've already touched upon, where a dispute has not crystallized. Number two, where the adjudicator has not been appointed in accordance with the terms of the contract. If the uh, contract provides that the RICS is the nominating body and you've gone to, for example, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, then the adjudication, adjudication appointment is not going to be valid. And again, there'll be no jurisdiction. So there's a lot of different scenarios whereby if you do not validly appoint the adjudicator correctly, the adjudicator will not have jurisdiction and cannot decide the dispute. So you have to be very careful when referring a matter to adjudication that you comply with all the relevant um, clauses of the contract and all relevant pro procedures. Otherwise, the adjudicator will not have jurisdiction. As I mentioned, the other type of jurisdiction is internal jurisdiction. And this is all to do with the scope of the dispute to be decided. The adjudicator only has jurisdiction to decide the dispute referred cannot go on a frolic, can't decide matters that the referring party have not referred. And as I've stated already, the notice defines the dispute. So the adjudicator, as to his internal jurisdiction, it is defined by what is stated in the notice. Having said that, if you're the responding party and you are raising a defense to the claim, for example, raising a counterclaim, then even though that is not in the notice, the adjudicator will have jurisdiction to decide on that aspect, provided that a withholding notice has been made. So the adjudicator does have jurisdiction to deal with defences, even though that's not in the notice, but otherwise the scope is all defined by the notice of adjudication. So that's jurisdiction, and it's very important. Often we do receive from other sides trying to raise challenges to jurisdiction and invite the adjudicator to resign. Now, often they do this as a ploy just to get more time. Obviously, adjudication is only a very short period of time. It's only 28 decisions until uh, from the date of the referral to the date of the decision, unless and any extension is agreed. And what they normally do is they try to raise jurisdictional challenges so that it takes a bit longer so that they can then ask for more time when issuing a response. But this is certainly something that is important in adjudication. The second to last question is, what is a slip in an adjudicator's decision? Now, this often happens, this, this will happen after the adjudicator has issued his decision. So the adjudicator will have issued his decision to both of the parties. The parties will obviously review that decision. And what sometimes happens is that after the decision has been issued, they submit to the adjudicator that there has been a slip and that they want this to be corrected. Now, not everything can be corrected after the decision has been issued. Only clerical, typographical, and mathematical errors can be corrected. Now, the important distinction is that an adjudicator cannot make amendments that give effect to secondary thoughts or intentions after the decision has been made, but only giving proper effect to his first thoughts. And what that means is, is he can't then go back on his decision and decide something completely different, which is in contradiction to the first decision he'd already issued. 
what it is doing is giving effect to the first his decision already made. So if, for example, he decided that uh, a sum of money was due and it was less the amount previously certified, but there's an arithmetical error in the amount less previously certified, then that would be a slip and that can be amended. It's giving effect to the decision already made, but it's not going beyond that. It's not seeking to uh, readdress matters or anything like that. And that is the important thing. It is only slips that can be amended. And that is why it is called the slip rule. Now, the important aspect of the slip rule is that the adjudicator has to amend it within a reasonable period of time after making their decision. And the scheme for construction contracts provides that they have five days following the issue of the decision to make any such amendments. So if you have received an adjudicated decision and you consider there to be a slip, not that necessarily there's something wrong or you're like, what a poor decision has been made, but that they've, for example, made a typographical error or an arithmetical error, then you need to ensure that you submit that to the adjudicator as soon as possible after the decision has been made so that the adjudicator can consider this. Importantly, though, if you have submitted throughout the, the adjudication that you do not consider the adjudicator to have jurisdiction, if you carry on with the proceedings without prejudice to your submission, they do not have jurisdiction. If you are making submissions as to the sli a slip in adjudicator's decision, you can be considered as waiving any challenges you've made to jurisdiction. So you need to make sure that when you make any submissions as to the slip rule, that you are reserving your rights as to any jurisdictional challenges made. You have to do it throughout the adjudication process and as well when submitting that there's been any slips. The final question is, what if the adjudicator's decision is obviously wrong? Now, unfortunately, given that an adjudicator adjudication is only 28 days, it is often the case that parties get a decision that they are not happy with. And that is why the phrase rough justice often occurs. Even if you put forward your case, you think it's such a strong case, it's so obvious, there are times where the adjudicator will go the complete opposite way and will make a, have reach a poor decision. And unfortunately that is, that is assisted by the fact that it is such a short period of time that a decision is made. Now, you cannot appeal an adjudicator's decision, and that is important to note. Now, what is normal, normally the case, unless the parties have agreed otherwise, is that an adjudicator's decision will be temporarily binding. Now, that, what that means is, is that they do have to follow that, but the dispute can be finally determined. It is only temporary binding the adjudicator's decision, and the actual dispute can be finally de determined and that can be determined by referring the matter to litigation or arbitration, depending on which clause is provided for in the contract, or by agreement of the parties. They can reach a settlement agreement which finally determines the dispute. So even if the adjudicator's decision is wrong, subject to it being only temporarily binding, there are avenues to you, for you to go down. But having said that, you can't all of a sudden decide to appeal the decision or anything like that. When there is enforcement proceedings, let's say, for example, an adjudicator has reached his decision and the losing party has not complied with that decision, then the successful party can bring enforcement proceedings. Now, echoing the fact that you can't appeal them, in most instances, enforcement proceedings will be successful, giving effect to the adjudicator's decision. The only two scenarios where you can raise challenges to enforcement is one, which we've already discussed, where the adjudicator did not have jurisdiction. Let's say the adjudicator made a non-binding decision that he considered he did have jurisdiction, but you still maintain he did not have jurisdiction. In any enforcement proceedings, you can raise those jurisdictional challenges again, and the court may be agreeable to, may agree with you, and therefore submit that actually the adjudicator did not have jurisdiction to decide the dispute that he actually, the decision he reached. And therefore, because of that, the actual decision is unenforceable. So you've got jurisdiction, that's one challenge to enforcement. The second challenge to enforcement is when there's been a breach of natural justice. However, it is very difficult to prove and is only in rare instances. 
So typically adjudication decisions will be enforced. And unfortunately there is rough justice. So that is something to always bear in mind when you are going to refer a dispute to adjudication. So that concludes today's seminar. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions, Julie. Yes, there is. Um, going back to one of the earlier points, someone's asking, uh, says, hi, Brandon, how about the unliquidated damages? When is the client entitled to them? Yeah, so, so unliquidated damages is typically coined as general damages. And when you have general damages, it is much more difficult to prove, which is why there is liquidated damages clauses in the contract in the first place. You don't actually have to prove the loss that you have suffered. All you have to do is rely on the contract, which says I'm entitled to X amount for X amount of weeks. When you have general damages, it's a lot more difficult to prove. And what you have to prove is that the loss you suffered is a direct result of what has happened. So there's a higher burden of proof. And the case is Hadley versus Baxendale. So if I don't know who, who asked the question, but if they just look up the case of Hadley versus Baxendale, Gap gives a brief overview of when you can claim general damages. Okay, thank you very much. If there are any other questions, now is the time to ask them, either Q&A or the chat tool in the bottom bar there, please help yourselves. And as we said previously, if there is something you want to ask, but you don't want to ask it in an open forum, you can see Brandon's email address on screen there, brandon.silver at fletcherday.co.uk. Okay, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Brandon, for uh, spending your time with us thank this you. evening. Uh, we are back tomorrow with Mohammed Hack and the penultimate in his Adjudication Matters series. Uh, we're looking at payment adjudication tomorrow. So if you would like to log in for that, uh, please email me seminars at fletcherday.co.uk and we will send you the login details. Um, otherwise, we wish you all a good evening and we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.